Dare to Defy Part 3 Parallel World Book 3 Written and Narrated by Christine Kersey Chapter 26 Tell your mother goodbye and then we'll get you processed. Louise said it like she was checking me in for a routine doctor's appointment. She came around the counter and stopped, waiting for me to say my goodbyes. Wait, I managed to say, but my throat was scratchy and the word was barely audible. What was that? Louise asked. I swallowed convulsively. Wait! This time it came out loud and clear. Susanna pulled me into her arms and murmured into my ear, You can do this, Morgan. You're strong and powerful. You are in control. I pulled back from this woman who was playing the role of my mother and stared at her. She smiled in a way that conveyed she meant what she just said. Then she nodded once and added, Your family, especially your sister, wants this for you. I got her message loud and clear, and as I thought about Amy, I forgot a little bit about myself and was able to pull myself together. Right. I'll come visit you as soon as they allow me to, okay? I hoped I would be long gone before then. Okay. She pulled me into another hug, and I enjoyed the warmth of this stranger's embrace. I knew I wouldn't have anyone giving me that kind of affection once I passed through the door to the right of the reception desk. She released me, and I tried to smile to show I would be okay, but my chin quivered, and I had to bite my lip to keep my emotions in check. "'Go with Louise now, honey,' Susanna said. I nodded, then turned away from my fake mom and toward the woman waiting next to the counter. "'Right this way, dear,' Louise said. I wondered if her demeanor would stay friendly once we stepped through those doors. Was her kindness all for show? For the families, that is, not for me. Forcing my feet to move, I walked toward her, then looked over my shoulder at Susanna. She smiled warmly, like a mother would. When I turned back to Louise, she was holding the door open for me. "'Please come this way,' she said. Beyond her, I saw sterile white walls, the same walls I'd seen the first time I'd been brought here. The stark difference this time was that instead of a pair of enforcers gripping my arms and forcing me down the hallway, I was going on my own. That thought gave me a small bit of courage. I was doing this by choice. I had a mission. We walked down the hall with me pulling my suitcase behind me and walked past the door where the unfriendly Tammy had checked me in. We stopped next to another door. This one I remembered as well. This was where I'd met Dr. Bradley. Last time, an enforcer had brought me here and locked me in. This time, Louise opened the door and invited me in. The doctor will be with you in a few minutes, she said. Please make yourself comfortable. Then she left, and I didn't hear the door lock. What a difference it made when you came there voluntarily. It made sense, though. Someone forced to come in was less likely to be cooperative, so of course they would keep a closer eye on them. Then it occurred to me that maybe they only inserted the tracking chip into the people who were dragged in. Maybe I wouldn't even get one this time. That would vastly simplify things when it was time to get out. Feeling better, I changed into the gown that had been set on the exam table. Isn't that what someone who came here voluntarily would do? Then I sat on the paper-covered table. A few minutes later, Dr. Bradley arrived. This is it, I thought. This is the first test of someone who knew me before. Now when she sees me, she will either recognize me, or my new look and extra weight will hide my true identity. Good morning, Hannah, Dr. Bradley said. How are you today? Okay. Good. Welcome to Camp Willamoss. Thanks. I'm Dr. Bradley. I just need to do a brief exam, then someone will take you to your room. Wanting to keep our conversation to a minimum, I nodded but didn't reply. She waved a card in front of her monitor, then set it on the counter and looked at me. Please step on the scale. I did as she asked, and as before, the scale in her office didn't have a retinal scanner, so I didn't know yet if the contact lenses would work. She looked at the numbers. Okay, go ahead and sit on the exam table. She went to her computer and typed something in, then came back to me. She took my blood pressure, which I was certain must have been higher than usual. Then she listened to my lungs and heart. She went to her computer and typed some more, then stepped back over to me. I'm glad you came here voluntarily, Hannah. You have some hard work ahead of you. I do? Yes. 
you need to lose at least 30 pounds. Though this wasn't a surprise, it was still disconcerting to hear. It was more than what I'd had to lose before. She went to the cabinet and pulled something out, then came back to me, a needle in her hand. What's that? I asked, knowing exactly what it was. We require all residents of Camp Willem Moss to have a chip inserted, Hannah. Why? I recoiled as if needles frightened me, which was laughable when I thought about the knife Billy had used to slice out the previous chip. A needle was nothing in comparison. It tracks your heart rate during workouts, she said, among other things. It was those other things that had me worried, and I wondered if there was any way to avoid getting the chip inserted. I scooted back on the paper covering. I hate needles, Dr. Bradley. Isn't there a different way to track my heart rate when I work out? Her friendly demeanor slipped. No, I'm afraid there isn't. Now please hold still. Though I wanted to fight this, I knew it would be a bad idea. I could see it playing out in my head. Dr. Bradley would get an enforcer or two to come hold my arm while she inserted the chip, and evermore they would keep an eye on me as I would be labeled uncooperative. I scooted forward and held my arm out, a tentative smile on my face. I'm sorry, I'm ready now. Her friendly smile slid smoothly back into place. Very good. She pressed the needle into my arm, and a moment later she was done. It hurt more than I remembered, but maybe that was because last time it had taken me by surprise, and I hadn't even realized she'd poked me until it was over with. This time I was just glad she didn't notice my fading scar from where I'd cut out the last chip. She placed a small bandage over the spot where the chip was now embedded, then went to her computer and typed something. You said the chip does other things besides track my heart rate, I said. What else does it do? I was all curious innocence, the voluntary resident who only wanted to lose a few pounds. She smiled at me. It's important that we know where our residents are at all times, so it helps with that. Oh, I nodded like this was something one would expect in a fat center, you mean like a tracking device? She looked up from the computer screen. Yes. Do you have one? I asked. Her eyebrows shot up as if the question had startled her, but she quickly recovered and ignored my question. Hannah, it's important that you weigh yourself each morning before going to breakfast. She smiled. Can you make sure and do that? Why hadn't she given me that explicit instruction the last time I'd been processed? I remembered how I'd been punished as had my roommate, when I'd failed to weigh myself daily. I dreaded weighing myself the next morning. If my contact lenses didn't trick the retinal scanner into thinking I was Hannah Jacobs, I would be in serious, serious trouble. She took a small vial out of the cabinet, along with another needle, then stepped toward me. I'm going to take a small sample of blood. This was new. What for? We'd like to have a baseline for all of our residents. A baseline of what? She put a band of rubber around my upper arm, then swabbed the inside of my elbow with a small, moist pad. Make a fist, please. What do you mean by a baseline? I asked again. She ripped open the packaging which held the needle, then glanced at me. Cholesterol and things like that. I could only assume the things like that included the drugs in the power bars. She slid the needle into my vein, and a moment later, dark red blood began filling the vial. When it was three-quarters full, she pulled the needle out and pressed a cotton ball to the inside of my elbow. Hold that there, please. She finished her task and placed a strip of tape over the cotton ball. You may change back into your clothes now, and someone will come get you and help you get settled. Okay. She took the vial of blood and left the room. As I changed into my clothes, I wondered if it would be Kiera who would come and get me like the first time I'd been here. Though a familiar face would be nice, I was scared to see someone who knew me. What if my true identity was immediately revealed? A few minutes later, the door opened, and when a girl I didn't know came in, relief swept over me. She was about my age and looked vaguely familiar. She'd probably been at Camp Willemos when I was here before. Someone with her privileges had to earn the trust of the people in charge, but I hadn't known that many people, and certainly didn't know her. Hi there, Hannah. I'm Katie. Hi. Grab your bag and follow me, okay? I grabbed the handle of my small suitcase and wheeled it out of the room as I followed Katie. We went to the elevator and she waved a card in front of the reader. She held the card out to me. 
This is yours. You'll use it to get to the places where you need to be. I took it from her. It looked just like the one I'd had before, an unbroken canvas of blue. I wondered if they'd made any changes to security since Billy and I had escaped. The door to the elevator slid open and we stepped inside. As she waved her card in front of the reader and pressed the number eight, I remembered that the last time I'd been at Camp Willamas, I'd been assigned to the sixth floor. I wondered what floor Amy was on. Girls were either on the sixth or eighth floors. Perhaps she would be on my floor. Moments later, we arrived on my new floor, and Katie led me through a foyer and down a hallway that looked just like the one on the sixth floor. No one was around, and I knew that was because everyone was either in class or doing their assigned jobs. Even though I was worried about being outed as Morgan Campbell, and even more worried about not getting out in time to get to the tunnel in Fox Run, I enjoyed a small measure of comfort in already knowing how things worked around here. Last time I hadn't known anything, and I had made many mistakes. We stopped in front of room 11, and she knocked, then opened the door. No one was in the room. Put your suitcase in the closet. Kitty pointed to an empty closet, then pointed to a neatly made bed. You'll sleep there. She paused, giving me a moment to take in my surroundings. Let me show you where the bathroom is. I followed her down the hall to a nearby bathroom. There are three other bathrooms on this floor, but this is the one you'll use. She pulled out the complimentary bag of toiletries and handed it to me. Deja vu washed over me. Trying to act like this was all new to me, I took the bag from her. This is free of charge, she said. But if you need anything else, it will be charged against the money you earn. I earn money? I asked. Sort of. It's placed in an account that you can draw against to buy the supplies you need. It's not like they give you the money. Oh. She grabbed one of the thin, scratchy towels that were stacked on a shelf and handed it to me. Here is the towel you'll use. Once a week, you'll get a fresh one. Okay. For now, she said, you'll wait in your room until your roommate comes to get you for lunch. She'll show you where the cafeteria is. We went back to my room, and Katie left me there to get settled. I unpacked the few belongings from my suitcase, then wondered what to do next. I had half an hour until lunch, and until I met my new roommate, so I decided to do a little reconnaissance. I left my room and went into the hallway, then walked toward the bathroom Katie had shown me. I went past it and followed the hallway all the way around. I only saw one girl, it must have been her assigned time to do homework or work out, but I didn't recognize her and she barely acknowledged me. Soon I was back in the foyer. I knew better than to venture beyond my own floor. The chip in my arm would alert the enforcers if I went somewhere I wasn't supposed to. Plus, my key card wouldn't allow me to go very many places anyway. I hadn't seen anything useful and I hadn't found Amy. I went back to my room to wait for my roommate. A short time later, the door opened and my new roommate walked in. Hi, she said with a smile. I'm Lori. Chapter 27 It was the Lori I'd known when I'd first arrived in this world. The Lori who'd sat next to me in class. The Lori whose father was the head of the local fat squad. The Lori who'd been so jealous of my budding relationship with Connor that she'd done all she could to get me committed to Camp Willamos. But she wasn't overweight. And her father was the head of the fat squad in Timber Hills. Why was she here? I opened my mouth to speak and almost blurted, What are you doing here? But I stopped myself in time. Hi, I said instead, my eyes wide. She stepped toward me. You're Hannah, right? Almost afraid to speak, I nodded. She didn't seem to recognize me. The glasses, the colored contacts, the new hair color and style, not to mention the way my face had filled out with a weight gain. All those things helped to hide my real identity. Are you hungry? she asked. I'd been too nervous to eat breakfast, but now I was starving. Yes. Great, she said. Let's get some lunch. I followed her to the elevator and stood next to her as we waited for it to arrive. Still trying to digest the fact that my new roommate was my old nemesis, I asked, How long have you been here? The night I'd been dragged out of my home and into Camp Willamos, I'd been absolutely furious with her. But now I was so focused on my mission that I was mostly able to put that aside. Three weeks, she answered. So, she'd arrived some time after Billy and I had escaped. Interesting. 
She didn't seem upset about being there, and I wondered if that was how she really felt, or if the compliance drug and the power bars had taken the edge off any anger she might have felt. We rode the elevator in silence, and a few moments later the doors opened to reveal the cafeteria. It was exactly as I remembered it. The smells and sounds washed over me, giving me an overpowering sensation of deja vu. "'You get in line there,' she said, pointing to the line that had formed. "'Then you wave your card in front of the reader, and the workers will give you your food.' "'Is the food any good?' I asked, playing the role of newbie. "'It's not too bad,' she said. "'My favorite is the power bars we get with each meal.' Her face seemed to light up at the mention of the power bars. "'Bars?' I asked. "'How many do you get?' Most people get two, although some people are lucky and get three, she laughed, but then they get less of the regular food. Oh no, it was probably the criminal types who got three. I wondered if Amy was getting three, as a stand-in for me it seemed likely. Physically, she was small, so even two per meal would have an impact on her. We went to the end of the line, and I searched for Amy among everyone in the room. Who are you looking for? Lori asked. No one, I said, realizing I was being too obvious. I was just wondering if anyone I knew was here. And? I smiled at her. Nope. She smirked. I guess you're stuck with me then. Yeah, I thought, and I'm not too happy about it. She nudged me in the back and said, your turn. I bristled at her touch, but moved forward and waved my card in front of the reader, pretending her presence didn't bother me. A short time later, we had our food, and I followed her to a table. She sat by a gaggle of four girls who all seemed to look to her as their leader. "'This is Hannah,' she said, motioning to me with her head as we set our trays on the table. "'Your new roommate?' a girl with long blonde hair asked. "'Yes.' Lori's gaze went around the table. "'Introduce yourselves, girls.' I tried to remember their names as they rattled them off. Emily, Taylor, Brittany, Madison. "'Hey,' I said in greeting as I began eating my tofu. "'Where are you from?' the blonde, Taylor, asked. "'Edgewood,' I said, giving the name Jack had told me. "'What about you? Where are you from? How long have you been here? What's it like here?' I hoped the list of questions would get them talking about something other than me, and I was right. I barely listened as they spoke, instead focused on finding my sister, although I tried to be subtle in my search. Then I saw her. She had just gotten her food and was walking in my direction— Not able to pull my gaze away, I stared at her. She looked okay, not the zombie I'd feared, but the slump of her shoulders told me that she wasn't enjoying her stay at Camp Willamos. As she got closer to my table, I felt a sharp jab in my side and turned to see Lori smirking. "'That's Amy Campbell,' she said in a low voice. "'You've heard about that pathetic little story, haven't you?' Anger at her cavalier attitude welled up inside me, but I focused on my sister. "'No,' I looked back at Amy as she passed nearby. Then I saw her sit at a table by two girls I hadn't seen before. They seemed to be friends with her, which made me happy. I knew her sister, Lori said. Maybe you've heard of her? Morgan Campbell? I noticed the other four girls at the table looking at Lori with admiration because she knew someone who was now famous. The name sounds familiar, I said. What was the deal with her again? Lori made a sound in her throat like she couldn't believe I was so ill-informed. She was only the person who escaped from this place. I could hear the duh in her voice. Oh yeah, I said. Now I remember. She and some boy got out of here. I crinkled my nose. Why'd they leave anyway? This place seems okay to me. Taylor, the blonde girl, laughed. You just got here, sweetie. Give it some time. I was talking, Lori said with a glare, and Taylor immediately closed her mouth. Lori ignored her and turned back to me. Like I was saying, she escaped, but the part that most people don't know, the part that I find most interesting, is why she was here in the first place. This should be good, I thought. What do you mean? I thought everyone was here to lose weight. Lori scanned my body. Well, you obviously need to. Heat flooded my face, and I wanted to slap her, even though what she said was true. But she didn't have to say it like that and write to me. I, on the other hand, look good and don't need to lose a pound. Then why are you here? I asked. This time my question was sincere. I was intensely curious as to why in the world she was there. That's not important right now, she said. She waved her hand as if shooing away a pesky insect. 
Right now, what's important is my connection to Morgan Campbell, infamous criminal. At least she was honest about the fact that her importance only came from her ties to me. Inwardly, I grinned, thoroughly enjoying my notoriety and the secret of my true identity. How are you connected? I asked. Girls, Lori said, evidently granting permission for her posse to speak. Chapter 28 For one, the girl named Madison said, Lori and Morgan went to the same school. Her bright blue eyes widened when she spoke. For two, Lori knew Morgan personally. Yeah, Brittany said. Lori actually invited Morgan to join the track team, and she did. Ah, I tried to act suitably impressed. That's really cool. I know, right? Brittany smiled, obviously pleased to be associated with Lori. There's more, Taylor said, leaning forward and clearly enjoying the build-up to the big reveal. This is the part I was interested in. What? I glanced at Lori, who seemed to be basking in the glow of everyone's worship and admiration. There was this boy, Taylor said. Isn't there always, Madison said, looking at me like I would know all about this. Taylor frowned, apparently not liking to be interrupted. Anyway, she said, stretching out the word to emphasize the fact that she'd been interrupted. There was this boy, Connor. My heart pounded at the mention of his name, and the whole story came flooding back to me. He's super hot, Brittany threw in. So you've met him? I asked. Well, no, she said, but Lori told us all about him. Oh, I said. Like I was saying, Taylor said as she rolled her eyes, Connor and Lori were dating and getting pretty serious. I almost shouted, what? But managed to stop myself in time. And that's when Morgan showed up, Taylor continued. She was the new girl at the school, and she went after Connor, hard. Of course, Connor wasn't interested. He was in love with Lori, Madison added, glancing in Lori's direction. I looked at Lori. She was leaning back in her chair, smiling as the story unfolded. I wondered how many times she told this particular fairy tale, and if she told it so many times that she'd actually come to believe it. To keep from laughing, I picked up my skim milk and took a sip. That's right, Taylor said, but Morgan didn't care. She would appear at the most inconvenient times, like this one time, at the end of track practice, Connor was about to kiss Lori, but Morgan showed up and got right in the way. I almost choked on my milk. Lori had taken the truth and twisted it around. I'd been the one Connor had been about to kiss, and Lori was the one who'd gotten in the way. Everyone was looking at me, evidently expecting a response of some sort. That's awful, I managed to utter. This other time, Taylor said, Connor took Lori on a date and Morgan actually showed up at the same place. Maybe she didn't know they would be there, I said. Even though they were spouting lies, I felt a need to defend myself as if what they were saying was true. It was so messed up. No, she knew, Lori said. I had a hard time looking at her. How was I supposed to live with her? Suddenly, I missed Alex, Piper, Cassidy, and especially Billy. We'd been a family. This was just a group of snarky girls who had nothing better to do than tell lies disguised as truth. How do you know that? I asked Lori. She sat up straight and leaned toward me. I just do, Hannah. I was taken aback by her aggressiveness. Clearly, she was not used to being questioned. Everyone was probably so enthralled by her tale that it never occurred to them that it might all be lies. Then I remembered the way she had been back in Timber Hills. She didn't like to be questioned then, either. It would seem the power bars didn't do much to change that about her. Okay, I said. She slouched in her chair. Go on. She directed this to Taylor, her hand flitting in the air. So, Taylor said, Lori and Connor are having this intimate date, and Morgan walks right up to them and starts talking to Connor like Lori isn't even there. Taylor shook her head like she couldn't believe it, and she shouldn't have since it was all a lie. I could hardly stand to listen to them slander me any longer. Why was Morgan sent here? I asked. Brittany pushed her short, dark hair behind her ears and picked up the story. So. Morgan has the nerve to bring homemade cookies to school and pass them out. And get this, she leaned forward for emphasis, 
They were made with real sugar. Can you believe that? I think it was kind of brave, Emily said in a soft voice. I looked at the girl with wavy auburn hair and thick glasses and smiled. Maybe she wasn't as much of a follower as the other three. Em, it was stupid. Madison said it like it was almost too obvious for words. You know it's totally against the rules to do that. And Lori said Morgan didn't even try to hide the fact that she had the cookies. She turned to Lori for confirmation. That's right, Lori said. Maybe the rule is what's stupid, Emily said, this time a little louder. Maybe that's why you're here, Lori said with a tone of disgust, because you can't stop yourself from eating stuff like that. Emily seemed to shrink back at the venom in Lori's voice, and I wondered why she sat at this table. I looked at the other three girls. Brittany seemed uncomfortable with the attack on Emily, but Taylor and Madison were nodding. What do you think, Hannah? Taylor asked. Ah, uh, I stammered, wondering if I should tell the truth or go along with the program. I decided at this stage of the game I should do the latter. I think we should follow the rules. But what about that rule? Taylor pressed. And are you going to eat your power bars? She pointed to the two bars still on my tray. Why? I asked, ignoring her first question. Do you want them? Of course, but I don't know if he'll let me. I turned in the direction she was looking and saw several enforcers entering the cafeteria and beginning to circulate among the tables. Why are they here? I asked, although I knew exactly why. To make sure everyone eats their power bars, Emily said, but I don't know why they care. Plus, everyone always eats them anyway. They just want to make sure we all get the appetites of pressing in them, Lori said, as if she had all the answers. I started to turn back toward the table, but paused to look at Amy. She was talking to her table mates, and she seemed like she was comfortable with them. Hannah, you'd better eat your power bars before the enforcers get to our table, Emily said. What will they do if I don't? I asked. I'd been hoping I could stash one in my pocket to give to Danny and Jack. The sooner I got what they wanted, the better. I don't know. Everyone always eats them. I didn't think my first day here was a good time to show rebellion, so I unwrapped the first power bar and lifted it toward my mouth. The delicious smell hit my nose and my mouth watered in remembrance. I took a bite and savored the flavor, although my mind raced in fear at what eating these addictive bars would mean. After the first bite, I quickly ate the rest, then picked up the next one. An enforcer stopped next to our table. Adrenaline pulsed through me as I felt his eyes on me. My hands nearly shook as I pretended he wasn't there and began eating a second power bar. Go away, go away, go away, I chanted in my mind. A moment later, he moved on. He seemed really interested in you, Taylor said. It's just because she's new, Lori said. I hope she was right. All I needed was for any of the enforcers to show special interest in me. You never said exactly why Morgan was brought here, I said. I still wanted to hear Lori's side of things, though after all her lies, I wasn't certain I could believe her. Chapter 29 Like everyone said, Lori continued, Morgan brought the cookies to school, which was against the rules. She was also fat. I bristled at her comment. At the time she'd known me, I'd only been a little overweight, certainly not what I considered fat. I glanced at the others and saw some of them looking down at the mention of the word. All of them were a little overweight, too. That's why they were at Camp Willamas, evidently, so I wasn't surprised that they were uncomfortable with that label. Lori went on, oblivious to the reactions of the other girls. My dad is ahead of the fat squad in our town, and after what happened with Morgan while I was on my date, I'd had enough of her. I tipped him off to what she'd done, and then we looked up her weight history and saw she'd recently been gaining weight. Now I wanted her to stop talking. I didn't know about this part, where she looked at my private information, and now she was telling anyone who had listened that I'd gained weight. My face reddened with mortification. She hadn't quite gone over her limit, Lori continued. But I convinced my dad that she was a troublemaker, so he adjusted her limits, which put her just over the line. "'What's wrong, Hannah?' Taylor asked. I realized I'd clenched my jaw and narrowed my eyes. I'd also balled my fists, which were thankfully in my lap under the table, but my fury must have been clear on my face. I forced myself to relax. "'Nothing. I'm fine.' "'Are you sure?' she asked. "'You seem upset.' 
Lori looked at me and raised her eyebrows like she was waiting to hear my response. What I wanted to say was, This girl, Lori, that you all seem to look up to is a fraud and an evil person and deserves to be thrown into a pit of live spiders. What I actually said was, I'm just a bit overwhelmed by everything, I guess. Finish your story, Madison said to Lori. I'm sure Hannah will like this next part. Lori settled back into her seat with a smirk. You think so? I know it's my favorite part. She looked at me. So, my dad and I saw that Morgan had put on the pounds recently, which showed a pattern of weight gain. At first, I wondered if she was pregnant. What? I said. I couldn't help myself. Her statement was so outrageous. Lori looked a little surprised at my outburst. Well, yeah. Why else would someone suddenly start gaining weight? Feeling a need to defend myself, I said, lots of reasons. Such as? Obviously, she didn't like to be questioned. I wanted her to continue with her story, so I said, So, was she pregnant? She hadn't reported it, Lori said, so I guess not. Reported it? I asked, puzzled. What do you mean? Now Lori looked confused. You do know that if you get pregnant, you're supposed to report it right away so you can get a waiver on your weight gain, right? Oh, right, yeah. She did a quick shake of her head as if to say, I have an idiot for a roommate. Anyway, she said, my dad didn't find any filings for waivers or anything, so he submitted a request to have her brought to a fat center for punishment and re-education. My embarrassment at showing my ignorance of basic rules in this world was replaced by fresh outrage at the role she'd played in getting me dragged out of my home and to this place euphemistically called Camp Willamoss, like it was some fun time we could have learning to eat healthy and take care of our bodies. Completely unaware that she was talking to Morgan Campbell and basically confessing to what she had done, she went on. The people at the fat headquarters move pretty fast when a squad leader puts in a submission request, she said. There have been too many times, especially when someone has broken a rule, that the criminal hears about the submission and bolts before they can be picked up. Gee, I thought, my fury notching up. I wonder why. So, she said, within just a few hours of my dad submitting the request, the enforcers went to Morgan's house. She grinned. Here's my favorite part. She paused for dramatic effect. When they went to get her, she resisted, and they had to taser her. Then they dragged her out of her house, limp as a dead body, I might add, and brought her here. It took every ounce of my self-control to suppress the urge to leap onto Lori and strangle her in front of the entire cafeteria. The night the enforcers had come to my house and taken me away had been the worst night of my life. A waking nightmare that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Well, Maybe on Lori, since she seemed to find it so amusing, but not on anyone else. I heard she even tried to escape once they got her here, she continued. But one of the enforcers tackled her and put an end to that dream. It was surreal how she was talking to me about what had happened to me and had no idea who I was. As angry as she made me, if I wanted to be successful in my mission, I had to become Hannah Jacobs, and an important part of that was to fit in with a group I belonged to by default. She sounds like a real loser, I said through nearly clenched teeth. I know, right? Taylor said. Then she looked thoughtful. But what I don't understand is how she managed to escape. Wanting to take the focus off of Morgan Campbell, I asked, Would you escape if you could? Taylor glanced at Lori before answering, which I found interesting. No, she said. I don't think it would be worth it to have them after you. I'd rather just get to my goal weight and get on with my life. Yeah, Brittany said. Me too. I looked at Emily and Madison, and they nodded their agreement. What about you, Lori? I asked, and all eyes went to her. Would you escape if you could? No. She glanced around to see if anyone besides our table was listening. I'm here to follow the rules. How long are you here? I asked, still wondering what she had done to be sent here. Six months, she said, and her shoulders slumped a little. I almost felt sorry for her since I knew what it was like, but after the story she told me, it was hard to work up much sympathy. Why are you in here, I asked, since you obviously don't need to lose weight. She smiled slightly. I assumed because of my perceived compliment. Then she compressed her lips into a straight line. I just met you, Hannah. 
Why do you think I would tell you something that's none of your business? One of the girls snickered, and I blushed at the scolding. A moment later, I was saved by a tap on my shoulder. I turned to see Katie, the girl who had brought me to my room, standing next to me. Come with me, Hannah, she said. You have an appointment with your caseworker. Images of Mr. Madsen flashed into my mind, and I hesitated. It's okay, Katie said. She's not so bad. She? So it wouldn't be Mr. Madsen. I pushed back from the table and stood, taking a final look at Amy, who was sitting quietly now and staring at her empty plate, then followed Katie across the room to the bank of elevators. My quick glance at my sister had worried me. She'd seemed chatty earlier, but now she didn't seem engaged in the conversations going on around her. Was the earlier image just a facade? Was she having a harder time than I'd thought when I'd first seen her? I really wanted to talk to her to get a better idea of how she was doing and to somehow give her hope that this nightmare would be over soon, but I had to wonder, would she recognize me? Chapter 30 A few minutes later, we were in the waiting area that I'd been in several times. This is Hannah Jacobs, Katie said to the muscular enforcer who sat behind the desk. He was the same one I'd faced when coming to this room before. Your card, he said, holding out his hand. I gave it to him. I'll see you later, Hannah, Katie said. I nodded to her, not feeling as terrified as I'd felt when Kiera had left me alone with the enforcer the first time I'd been here. Stand on the X, he said, as he went to the camera and put my card in a slot. I did as he asked, but feared getting my picture taken. What if Hanson saw it and recognized me? What if someone else saw it and recognized me? The waters of danger seemed to be lapping against my ankles, and I feared how deep they would become. Would they drown me? Look at the camera, he demanded, and I realized my face was tilted downward. I looked up, and he pressed a button, then he handed my card back to me. Have a seat. I slid the card into my pocket and sat down, with the enforcer just feet away. I visualized my photo going out onto their network and some facial recognition software identifying me as Morgan Campbell, and a dozen enforcers bursting into the room, their stun guns at the ready with Hansen in the lead. I suddenly found it hard to breathe as my gaze kept darting toward the door. Hannah Jacobs, a female voice stated. I looked up, and when my eyes met those of my caseworker, they widened. It was Mrs. Reynolds, the woman who had led the counseling group every night, the woman whose gaze had turned me cold every time it had zeroed in on me. This was my caseworker? I blinked and forced myself to settle down. Yes, I said. She smiled briefly. Come with me. I followed her down the hall, pretending to adjust my glasses as I turned the camera on. I wasn't sure exactly what kind of information Danny and Jack were looking for, but I figured this meeting could be interesting. Right this way, she said holding open the door to a small office. It looked just like Mr. Madsen's had looked, and I assumed all the caseworkers' offices were identical, although it was smaller than Dr. Tasco's. I remembered the office of the man who ran the place. Billy and I had quite literally dropped into his office through the ventilation system on the night we'd escaped. Remembering that night brought a tiny smile to my face and a small degree of comfort that I had done it once, so maybe I could do it again. Have a seat. Mrs. Reynolds motioned to a straight back chair. She sat in her seat, her desk between us. I slid into the seat and tried to avoid eye contact. Her gaze still had the effect of making me want to run away. How are you settling into Camp Willamoss? Okay, I guess. I stared at my lap, my right hand absently playing with the nails on my left hand. Look at me when I speak to you. Her voice was harsh. Reluctantly, I lifted my gaze and met hers. I waited for her to accuse me of impersonating Hannah Jacobs, but instead she picked up a sheet of paper and quickly scanned the contents. She looked directly at me. You have quite a bit of weight to lose, Hannah. Dr. Bradley said you need to lose 30 pounds. She paused. Are you aware of that? Was this a trick question? Of course I was, so I nodded. I can't hear the rocks in your head rattling. You need to speak. Though I was used to her meanness, I'd always thought it had been for show to keep control of the little group of criminals that I had belonged to, but evidently she just enjoyed it. Yes, Dr. Bradley told me. She smiled, but her eyes were cold. Good. And do you know how you're going to go about it? 
Again, this sounded like a trick question, but I played along. I'll need to exercise and eat healthier. That's right. And when you leave Camp Willamas, what will you do? I'll continue my good habits. She nodded, and I almost said I couldn't hear the rocks rattling around in her head, but bit my tongue instead. I'd like you to recite the pledge for me, Hannah. The request was unexpected, but I began, I pledge, stand up when you say it. Slowly, I rose from my chair. I pledge to always follow the rules and to take care of my body. I felt like a fraud as I uttered the words I despised, but I continued on like a good little camper. I will strive to put the good of all above the desires of one. A healthy me is a healthy world. She smiled again. Very good. You may sit. I sank back into my chair, my knees feeling weak under her eagle-like stare. Now, she said, let's discuss the rules that you must follow to have a successful stay with us. She paused. I understand you came here voluntarily. What made you decide to do that? This was a question Mr. Madsen, who I was beginning to miss, had never had the opportunity to ask me, and I wondered if it was part of the standard questionnaire they asked people who turned themselves in, or if I was being asked for a different reason, perhaps because they knew I wasn't really Hannah Jacobs. Well, uh, I had gained some weight recently, and my mom thought— Your mom thought? The way she pounced on my words startled me. What about you? What did you think? Wasn't it time for her to give me my work schedule and send me on my way? This was pure torture. Then I remembered that this whole thing was being recorded, and who knows how many people would see it. I needed to step up my game. Well, my mom and I discussed it, and we agreed that it would be in my best interest to come here and get the help I needed. What do you think you need help with exactly, Hannah? To learn to stop putting food in your mouth? Her attitude shocked me. Did she really not care at all about helping teenagers who are struggling with weight issues? Or did she just despise us and put up with us because we allowed her to have a job? I was pretty sure it was the latter. I guess I need help getting into an exercise routine and to learn about nutrition and eating healthier. What you mean is, she said, you have no self-control and you need us to force you to exercise and to prevent you from eating what you shouldn't. She paused her eyes glittering with undisguised disgust. Isn't that right, Hannah? I was so glad I hadn't been assigned to her before when I'd been so terrified and uncertain. And what was Katie talking about when she'd said she wasn't so bad? Had she actually met this woman? I guess, I muttered. What was I supposed to say? Actually, I'm here to get dirt on you and the rest of the people who work here, and while I'm at it, I'm going to get my sister out of your evil clutches. Even though I would have enjoyed the look of shock on her face, it really wasn't the time for me to reveal my plans. Do you have any idea what it costs to house people like you? She asked. So that's what this was about. Was money becoming an issue? It's bad enough when we have to take in the delinquents, she said. But when someone has no control over what they eat or how they take care of their body, and their family thinks we can magically fix them, they don't seem to realize that the cost is much higher than what we make them pay. How much does it cost? I asked. Her eyebrows shot upward. Do you really think I'm going to answer that? Evidently not. Isn't my mom helping to pay for this? Families are required to pay a certain amount, she said, but do you really think that covers all the costs? I assumed that was a rhetorical question, and I kept my mouth shut. She sighed dramatically. The sooner you can get yourself under control, the better for everyone, Hannah. You're actually being quite selfish by coming here. My mouth fell open at this. Did she think us campers liked being here? We didn't make the rules that put us over some government-approved number requiring us to come. My complete shock at her attitude made me bold. Maybe if the government changed the rules about weight, the issue of housing would disappear. Now her mouth fell open. Didn't you just pledge to follow the rules, Hannah? Do you take that pledge so lightly? The rules are there for a reason. When people are overweight, the burden of health care for those people overwhelms our health care system, making it unaffordable for everyone. Do you really believe it's fair for someone who takes care of himself to have to pay extra for someone who refuses to do so? Her question reminded me of the counseling sessions I'd been forced to endure. I also remembered that she wasn't happy if we didn't give her the answer she wanted to hear. 
No, I said. I don't think that's fair. Then you need to rethink your last suggestion about changing the rules, she said. Wouldn't you agree? I knew the answer she wanted to hear. Yes. She glanced at her watch. I have another appointment in a few minutes, so let's go over the rules and your schedule. About time. The rules were the same as before, except for one addition that I found very interesting. We were required to eat the power bars that were given to us at each meal. I wondered what Jack and Danny would think of that. Here's your schedule, she said as she handed me a sheet of paper. Daily schedule for Hannah Jacobs. 7 to 7.30, breakfast. 7.30 to 11, work assignment. 11 to 12, exercise or work on homework. 12 to 12.30, lunch. 12.30 to 3, work assignment. 3 to 5, classes. 5 to 5.30, dinner. 5.30 to 8, exercise or work on homework. 8 to 9, nutritional counseling, room 908. 9 to 10, exercise or work on homework. 10 o'clock, lights out. My schedule was just as I remembered from before, except instead of going to a counseling group for delinquents, I had to go to a nutritional counseling group, and I assumed my work assignment would be bathroom duty again. Go back to the waiting area, Mrs. Reynolds said. Someone will come and get you. As I walked to the waiting area, I turned off the camera, then I sat in one of the chairs and wondered if Kyle would be my work supervisor again. Chapter 31 Katie came and got me a few minutes later, and I followed her to the elevators. How'd it go? she asked. Okay. What did you think of Mrs. Reynolds? She wore a lopsided smile. I think she really is that bad. I'm going to tell her you said that. Frightened at the idea, I stared at her. She laughed. Not really, Hannah. I smiled, but on the inside I wondered if she really would. I don't even need to check your work assignment to know you're assigned to cleaning duties, she said as we rode the elevator upward. That sucks, I said. She laughed. All the new kids get that job. Some actually like it and some get stuck with it. Can I change to a different job? If your supervisor likes the way you work, he might recommend you for another job. We got off the elevator on my floor and walked down the hall. A moment later, we stood in the doorway of a supply room identical to the one I'd been in during my last day, and there was Kyle, my old supervisor. Kyle, this is Hannah. Hi there, Hannah. He walked toward me. I'm glad you're joining our little crew. It was the same welcome spiel he'd given me before. Hi. I'll take it from here, Katie. See you around, she said to me, then she left. Kyle gave me the list of things to clean and showed me the cart I would be using, then sent me off to start. Apparently there was one other girl who cleaned this floor, so it wouldn't all be on me. He suggested I find her and see what still needed to be done, so I headed down the hall toward the nearest bathroom. I found her in the second bathroom washing the mirror. Are you Jessica? I asked, using the name Kyle had given me. She looked at me in the mirror, then turned around. Yes, who are you? I'm Hannah. She set the bottle of glass cleaner on the counter. Kyle didn't tell me you would be coming. No, I thought. My arrival was kind of a surprise to everyone. Well, I said, here I am. This job sucks, she said, but at least now there will be two of us to do it. What's left to be done? I'm almost done with this bathroom, but if you can clean bathroom four, I can do the vacuuming. Okay. She turned back to the mirror and looked at me in the reflection. Do you know what you're supposed to do? I held up the sheet Kyle had given me. I can figure it out. Good, she said. Then she turned back to her task. I went to the bathroom that hadn't been cleaned yet and got to work. Soon it was time to stop and go to class. I dropped off my cart, then took the elevator to the classroom floor. I went straight to the office to get my schedule and my supplies. This time I knew they were supposed to give me my books. Then I headed to class. The first class was English. When I walked through the door, class was just getting underway. I scanned the room for an empty seat and was surprised to see my sister, and next to her was an open desk. My heart pounded with a mix of fear and happiness. Fear that she would recognize me and shout out my name in front of everyone. Happiness that I might have the chance to talk to her. Why are you late? The teacher asked, clearly irritated. I remembered this teacher. 
Billy had called her the Grey Witch. I remembered how she'd hit me in the back of the head with a textbook when I'd fallen asleep in her class. I'm new, I said as I handed her my late pass. She snatched it out of my hand and threw it in the trash. Find a seat. I went directly to the empty seat next to Amy. I glanced at her, but she ignored me, which kind of hurt my feelings. I knew it was dumb, but she was my sister, and I was here because of her. It was good she hadn't recognized me, but I wanted her to somehow know I was there for her. As the teacher droned on, I thought about what I would say to Amy to somehow hint that I was there to help her. You there, the teacher said. You in the glasses. I looked at her and realized she was talking to me, and I'd been totally daydreaming. Come to the front of class, and in your own words explain what I just said. A wave of fear crashed over me. I had no idea what she'd said, and I really, really didn't want to stand in front of the class and make a complete fool of myself. All eyes were on me, and a blush rose on my cheeks. Well? I'm sorry, I said, but I don't remember what you said. Her eyes narrowed. You mean you weren't paying attention. That is unacceptable in my class. You are to write a three-page paper on how you can be a better student. My eyes widened, but I kept my mouth shut. I wanted at the beginning of our next class. Too afraid to say anything, I just stared at her. Finally, she looked away from me, and I released a sigh. When class was over, I turned to Amy. Hi, I'm Hannah. When I spoke to her, I made my voice a little higher. I didn't want her to recognize it. She looked at me, fear on her face. What's your name? I asked. Don't talk to me, she said in a soft voice. You might get me in trouble. But class is over. Mrs. Needham doesn't like you. So? Who cared if the English teacher liked me or not? If she sees me talking to you, Amy said, she might start picking on me. Her logic caught me off guard, and before I had a chance to come up with a good answer, she darted out of the room. Disappointed I hadn't been able to talk to her, I left the room and headed to my next class, which was math. I got through that class without incident, and when class was over, I dropped my backpack off in my room and headed to the cafeteria. After I gathered my food, I turned to the room and saw Lori and the rest of the girls already at the table. I looked toward the table where Amy had sat earlier, but she wasn't there yet. Almost reluctantly, I headed to Lori's table and sat in the empty seat next to Emily. How was your first day? she asked. Okay, I guess. I scooped up some of the vegetable soup and began eating, but hardly tasted it. My first day had been less than stellar, and I was feeling less confident about this whole mission. As I ate, I thought about my top priority, getting Amy out of there. It was up to me to make that happen, but it wouldn't happen without the help of Jack and Danny, and they would only help if I got the information they wanted. I slipped on the persona of Hannah Jacobs and turned to Emily. How long did you say you've been here? She pushed her wavy auburn hair over one shoulder and adjusted her glasses. About five weeks. That meant she had arrived around the time Billy and I were planning our escape. When do you get to leave? I have to lose ten more pounds, she said, so I guess in about six weeks. She paused as she took a bite of her food. What about you, Hannah? How much weight do you have to lose? Thirty pounds. That's a lot, Lori said from across the table, obviously listening to our conversation. How long do you think it will take? Amy walked past our table, and I followed her with my eyes. It's rude to stare, Hannah, Lori said. I wanted to say something that would put her in her place, but didn't think Hannah Jacobs would do that. Instead, I pretended I hadn't heard her and turned to Emily. What's your favorite exercise equipment to use? I like the stationary bicycle, Emily said. What about you? The elliptical machine. Yeah, she said. That one's not too bad. Hannah, Lori said. You didn't answer my question. My hackles rose, but I continued to ignore her. It was kind of loud in the cafeteria, so it wasn't unrealistic that I wouldn't have heard her. The treadmill's okay, too, I said, keeping my focus on Emily. Except when they make you run on it, Emily said. I nodded, then felt a sharp pinch on my shoulder and was startled to see Lori standing behind me. She leaned toward me and whispered fiercely in my ear, Don't ignore me when I'm talking to you. As much as she tried to intimidate me, I just didn't feel afraid of her. It wasn't like before with Beth, who loved to bully me. I'd been through too much to allow Queen Bee to sting me with her attitude. Even so, I was playing a role, 
and if I wanted to fly under the radar, I had to play the part of the new girl who was uncertain about her surroundings. I'm really sorry, Lori. I pinched my leg as I looked at her, giving me a genuine look of discomfort. I guess I didn't hear you. She squinted like she didn't know if she should believe me or not. Don't let it happen again, she said. I won't, I promise. She went back to her place, ignoring me, I might add, and I ate the rest of my food, including the two power bars. When I saw Amy getting up from her table and walking toward the trash cans, I quickly gathered my things and got up too. Hurrying over to where we put our trays, I got there just as she finished dumping hers off. I did the same and caught up to her as she headed toward the elevator. Hi, I said, again trying to make my voice sound different than it normally did. She barely glanced at me. Hi. What's your name? She snorted. Didn't your friend tell you? Who? I guess her name's Lori. Obviously, Amy was aware of the things Lori, and probably lots of other people, were saying about her. Heavy guilt swept over me at what my mistakes were putting her through. Yeah, she said you're Amy Campbell. Did she send you over to pretend to be my friend? Amy asked. So I would share my innermost feelings with you so she could make fun of me? No. I could see that having Lori as a roommate was going to make this more difficult. How could I get Amy to trust me without revealing I was her sister? Because doing that would be too risky. It wasn't that I didn't trust her. After all she'd been through, I didn't think she would tell anyone. But what if they found out she knew and didn't report me? Would that put her in the spotlight for committing a crime of her own instead of just being the stand-in for me? I couldn't do that to her. Then what do you want, she asked. You just got here, right? We stopped in front of the elevator. Yeah. She waved her car in front of the reader. Then why would you want to be my friend? She turned and looked directly at me. I'm a freak here. Her eyes filled with tears. You don't want to be friends with a freak, do you? The elevator door slid open and she stepped on. Her reaction surprised me so much that I stayed where I was. As the door slid closed with her inside, I saw a tear slip down her cheek. Her sadness and misery broke my heart. I had to get her out as soon as possible. Chapter 32 I waved my card in front of the reader and rode the next elevator to my floor. I thought about Amy and how awful her life was right now. The only way I could fix things was to get the information Jack and Danny wanted. As soon as they got what they wanted, they would get me and Amy out of there. At least that was what they'd promised. So for now, I had to gather the data they required, proof that we were being drugged. How else to change the mind of the masses who only thought we came here to get help losing weight? The general population thought that fat centers were all benign and innocent, just the government assisting us in having a healthier lifestyle. After all, fat stood for federally assisted thinning. What could be bad about that? It was up to me to show the world what was really going on in these places. And right now, that meant going to the gym and showing how they treated us. But would people actually care? Or would they feel the treatment was justified since we were overweight? We didn't deserve to be treated with respect, right? I couldn't do anything about anyone's attitude. All I could do was provide video evidence of what was happening at Camp Willowmoss. I went to my room and changed into my workout clothes, then headed to the gym. As the elevator took me down to the third floor where the gym was located, my heart began to race. Austin, or Mr. Muscles as I thought of him, would be there. The last time I'd seen him... He'd been in his office with my roommate, Alex, and she'd been telling him she was pregnant. She really wasn't, but that was the ploy she'd used to get his key card for me, which Billy and I had used on the night of our escape. The reason I'd gone to his office that night was because I'd made a deal with him to take Alex's place when she left. At the time, it had been the right thing to do. I'd had no intention of following through, but it was the only way he would agree to get back together with Alex which meant it was the only way for me to get a staff member's key card. But now, knowing I would have to face him in the gym, my stress level rose. He wouldn't know it was me, but I knew how he really was, a bully to those who were weaker than him. I couldn't stand him. I arrived at the gym and checked in, then grabbed a towel and went to the warm-up area. A couple of other kids were warming up, but no one I knew. After stretching my muscles, I got on the treadmill and started jogging. 
It had been a month since I last worked out, and in that time I put on some weight, so it was a lot harder to run than I remembered. Pick up the pace. I turned and saw Austin standing next to my treadmill. My pulse rate skyrocketed, but I managed to turn on the glass cam. He looked at a device in his hand, then looked at me. Hannah, right? I looked at him and nodded. You're new, aren't you? I was struggling to catch my breath, so I nodded again. He grinned. One thing you need to understand from the start, Hannah. This is my gym, and you do what I say. Okay, I panted. He glanced at the device again. Since this is your first day, I'll cut you a little slack. But when you're in my gym, you better be working your butt off. He glanced at my rear end and laughed. And you need to work that butt off. The redness in my face increased, and I felt the familiar humiliation that I learned to expect. I wondered what Jack and Danny would think of the insult. Probably not much. Even though it made me mad, most likely no one else would care about it. I didn't respond to his insult, but just kept jogging. Finally, he walked away, so I turned the camera off. The battery would only last for ten hours, so I wanted to make each recorded minute count. I finished on the treadmill and walked toward the elliptical machine, looking at the other kids as I went. That's when I saw Amy in the warm-up area. She was by herself and seemed very focused on what she was doing. A boy walked past her and said something to her. It must not have been nice because she glanced at him and frowned, and after he walked away, I saw her wipe at her eyes. My big sister instinct kicked in, and I wanted to stand up for her, but how could I without giving myself away? I started on the elliptical machine, but watched for Amy and eventually saw her go to the row of treadmills where I just finished. She was in front of me and to the right, so I was able to keep an eye on her. And sure enough, it didn't take long for Austin to come harass her. He stopped next to her and she shrank from him. Clearly, she was familiar with his bullying tactics, but he just laughed. From where I stood, I could hear most of what he said and I cringed as I listened to him speak. I also turned on the camera. You think you're so cool, he taunted, because your sister is the famous Morgan Campbell. Well, I knew your sister and she was as much of a loser as you are. In fact, I'm not sure who's more of a loser, you or her. Amy didn't respond and kept running on the treadmill. I was proud of her for ignoring him. Then he reached over to the controls and sped up the treadmill. As Amy seemed to lose her footing and almost fell, I gasped, but she regained her balance. You need to go faster, you pathetic loser, Austin sneered. It was all I could do not to run over to him and claw his eyes out. It had been horrendous when I'd been the target of his punishments, but watching my little sister suffer and not be able to do anything about it was pure torture. It didn't take long for Amy to pant harder. What do you think of your sister, huh? Austin yelled. Look what she's making you go through. His words cut to the very heart of me, and hot tears rushed into my eyes. I used my towel to dry them, but couldn't tear my gaze away from the scene playing out in front of me. Other kids were watching, too, and I began to understand why Amy felt like a freak. No one cared about her. They only cared that she was there as a stand-in for me. I wondered if part of Austin's anger came from the fact that Alex had left and I wasn't there to take her place like he'd wanted. Did he have a special girlfriend now, or was he forced to be alone? Or did Alex's claim of pregnancy scare him off from having a girlfriend, at least for a while? When Amy didn't respond to Austin's question, he yelled even more. Can't you see that your sister doesn't care about you at all? Why else would she let you be here for her? She's a coward. How can you stand her? Look what she's making you go through. What kind of a person is she? Amy placed her feet on the sides of the treadmill belt, stopping her jogging, and turned to Austin. With fury clear in her eyes, she yelled, I hate her! I hate her! I hate her! My heart sank into my stomach, and all the blood drained from my face. She hates me. Of course she did. I would hate me, too. Then I saw Austin grin, and I knew his goal had been to turn her against me. I hate her, too, Amy. You know she stole my key card from me and got me in trouble. She doesn't care about anyone but herself. My eyes widened. He'd gotten in trouble because Billy and I had used his key card to escape? The thought made me happy. Amy glared at Austin and yelled just as loud as before, I hate you too! 
As quickly as Austin's grin had appeared, it was wiped off of his face. His eyes narrowed. Then he looked over his shoulder and gestured with his head. That's when I saw Hansen walking toward Amy, a lazy smile on his face. I flashed back to the night only a few weeks before when I'd driven a small knife into his back. It was the night of our escape, and Hansen had pinned Billy to the ground. I hadn't known what to do to help Billy, but then I'd seen the small knife on the grass. I'd picked it up and aimed for Hansen's neck, but he'd moved at the last moment, and I'd stabbed him in the back instead. That was when he'd said, I will kill you. Now, as I watched him approach Amy, I wanted to scream at her to run. But as I looked at her expression, I knew this wasn't the first time she'd met Hansen. She looked terrified. He held his baton in one hand and gently whacked it against the palm of his other hand as he stopped next to the treadmill where Amy's feet straddled the moving belt. It is inappropriate to speak to any of the staff in the manner you've spoken to Mr. Templeton. I'd never heard Austin's last name before. It was weird to hear him called that. I'd always thought of him as Mr. Muscles. You need to apologize. Hansen's voice was completely calm. Amy looked between Hansen and Austin, then she looked at me. As our eyes met, my heart pounded. It was almost like she was asking me to do something, but I had no idea what to do. Look at me when I'm talking to you, Hansen said. Then he hit the back of her leg with his baton. Amy obviously hadn't expected the blow, because the leg that Hansen hit collapsed beneath her, and she almost fell onto the moving belt, but she managed to grip the arms of the treadmill to keep from falling. Crying now, she pulled herself back up, then she grabbed her injured leg with one hand as she set her foot on the side of the treadmill to avoid the moving belt. I slowed my pace on the elliptical machine and grimaced in sympathy. Oh, how I wished I had the courage to do something to help my sister, but I'd only arrived that day. There was no way Jack and Danny would get us out now, and if I blew my cover, it would all be over. Apologize, loser! Hansen shouted loud enough for everyone in the room to hear. Sobbing now, Amy looked at the people nearest her, then she looked at Austin. I'm sorry. Austin grinned, evidently loving the control he had over every person in the room. What are you sorry for? Hansen asked. Amy hiccuped between sobs as she looked at Austin. That I said I hate you. You make sure and show the proper respect to the staff members here, Amy. Hansen said. Understood? She nodded. Good. Now get back on the treadmill and run for twenty minutes. She did as she was told, and the two men strolled away. I increased my pace on the elliptical machine, terrified they would stop by me next. They passed near me, but were talking and laughing in low voices and didn't seem to notice me. When I looked back at Amy, her shoulders shook, and I knew she must be crying with every step she took. I turned off the camera in my glasses, wondering if this was the kind of thing Danny and Jack were looking for. Abuse of those of us in Camp Willamaw seemed like a pretty significant issue that might change the minds of some of the people outside. At least I hoped it would. As I continued my workout, I kept an eye on Amy and saw her get off the treadmill and move to the weight machine. I imagined telling her who I really was, but her reaction was as yet unclear. Would she throw her arms around me in relief that I was okay? Or would she yell to Hansen, or any other enforcer who was nearby, that it was me, and that now she could be released? Would she be more than happy to turn me in, the sister that she hated? Or would she be thrilled to have an ally and a friend who she would work with side by side to get the evidence Jack and Danny wanted, and then be freed by people she'd never met? As much as I wanted to tell her I was there to help her, I was afraid of how she would react. Without doubt, she hated me right now. But if she spoke to me face to face, would she change her mind? Eventually, I would have to find out, because how could I help her escape without revealing myself? It seemed she trusted no one, which made me doubt she would leave this place in an escape slash rescue without having some prior knowledge. My next move would be to befriend her, if she would let me. Chapter 33 When I finished my workout, Amy was still doing hers. I didn't think it would be a good idea to approach her in the gym, not with Austin around. So I went back to my room and showered. Next, 
I started on the assignment Mrs. Needham had given me, a three-page paper telling how I could be a better student. I wrote what I figured she wanted to hear, then it was time to go to my nutritional counseling class. The class was held on the classroom floor, and we met at the same time Mrs. Reynolds' counseling group had met when I'd been here before. I arrived a few minutes before class started, and as I walked toward the room, I passed the classroom where Billy and I had met with Mrs. Reynolds. Curious to see if anyone from before was there, I peeked through the door. Half of the seats were occupied, and to my surprise, Amy was among the attendees. Her face was pale, and she looked incredibly sad. My heart ached to see her like that. Why was she there? She wasn't a delinquent. But then I realized she was there in my stead. Of course they would make her meet with the other criminals. I turned away from the classroom and walked toward my class. That's when I saw Mrs. Reynolds walking toward me. I wanted to turn and run in the other direction, but that would be too obvious. So instead, I calmly walked forward, not meeting her eyes. Hannah, she said as we got within a few feet of each other. Forced to acknowledge her, I stopped. Are you following your schedule? Yes, I said. Did she really think I wouldn't? Good, make sure that you do. Then she continued on without another word. Relieved that she'd only asked me that one question, I hurried down the hall to my classroom, not wanting to run into anyone else that might harass me. The classroom where we met for nutritional counseling was really two classrooms, with a curtain that separated the two rooms opened. There was space for a lot of kids there. Probably everyone who wasn't a criminal would be there. I quickly scanned the room and saw that most of the seats were filled. My gaze stuttered as it landed on Beth. She was talking to one of her friends, so she didn't see me staring at her. Was she still bullying kids into giving her their power bars? Or did the presence of the enforcers at mealtimes put a stop to that? Hannah! a voice called out. I looked toward the sound and saw Emily motioning to me to sit by her. Next to her were Taylor, Brittany, and Madison, but no Lori. Glad to have a group to sit with, I walked toward them, then noticed there was only one seat available and hesitated. Sit here, Emily said, patting the empty seat, which was next to her. I didn't want to get on Lori's bad side by taking her seat. She was already mad at me for ignoring her at dinner. What about Lori? She's not in this class, Emily said. Oh. Puzzled, I sat down and wondered where she could be. Then it dawned on me that she must be in the re-education class. She didn't need to lose weight, so she wasn't here for that reason. That could only mean she was here for punishment. Where is she? I asked, hoping Emily could verify my assumption. She meets down the hall. Her voice dropped to a whisper and her eyebrows rose. You know, with that other group. Why? I asked. What did she do? I don't know, she said with a smile but I'd sure like to. This girl didn't seem to like the leader of our little group. Interesting. Everyone rise for the pledge, a man said from the front of the room. I stood with everyone else and said the words I hated. Then we sat, and he began his lecture about proper nutrition and developing good eating habits. Several enforcers were stationed around the room, I guess to make sure we all behaved. When class was over, I walked with Emily to the elevator. It was like after a meal, everyone waiting to get on the elevators at once. We were in the middle of the herd, waiting for our turn, when I heard a familiar voice call out, and not in a friendly way. Is that you, Amy? You look a little sad. I turned to see who had spoken and saw Beth standing a few people away from Amy, a mean look on her face. I studied Amy, who seemed to shrink in on herself. She ignored Beth but I noticed the kids around Amy had backed away from her just enough to make her stand out. Answer me when I'm talking to you, you little pig, Beth shouted. I looked at the enforcers who were standing on the edge of the crowd, but they either didn't notice the commotion, and I didn't know how they could miss it, or they didn't care. Beth began moving toward Amy. I couldn't stand by this time and do nothing. I had to protect my sister. 
It reminded me of when I'd stood up to Shelby on Rochelle's behalf. That's what had led to my suspension, which is what had led to me running away. I hoped intervening now wouldn't have unintended consequences that I would later regret. Didn't matter. This was my sister. I had to do something, but as I took a step in Amy's direction, I felt a hand on my arm. No, Hannah, Emily urgently whispered. I yanked my arm away and pushed through the horde. Hi, Amy. My voice was loud and bright, like I hadn't noticed Beth and her bullying. Amy jerked her head toward me, obviously startled. Hi. Then she quickly looked at the floor. How's your day going? I tried to keep my voice conversational, like I just ran into a friend in the halls after class, but I could hear Beth breathing heavily behind us. Okay, I guess, Amy said. She spoke so softly that I barely heard her. Get out of the way, Beth muttered just behind me. I turned my head and smiled like I didn't realize I was supposed to be scared. Were you talking to me? I asked. Then I turned, so I was facing her fully. Hi, I'm Hannah. What's your name? Surprise clear on her face, her mouth hung open in an unflattering manner. Beth, she finally said. Hi, Beth, I replied. The kids nearby watched the exchange. She blinked, then frowned. You're new, aren't you? Yep, I grinned. Today's my first day. Her frown deepened. Then I'll cut you some slack, this once. I tilted my head, my eyebrows furrowed. What do you mean? Come on, Beth, one of her lackeys called. The elevator's here. She squinted at me. Just watch yourself. Then she walked toward an open elevator and got on. She's not very friendly, is she? I said to Amy, who looked at me from the corner of her eye. Her lips briefly turned upward, but she still kept her gaze toward the floor. Thank you, she said. Kids moved past us toward the elevators. Not everyone is mean, you know, I said. Then I lowered my voice. Some people are here to help. You're blocking traffic, an enforcer said behind me and shoved me forward. Amy walked away from me and got on the open elevator. I wasn't sure if she'd heard my last statement. I tried to follow her on board, but the same enforcer put his baton in the way, preventing me from getting on. Get the next one, he said. There was plenty of room on the one Amy had boarded, so I wasn't sure why he wouldn't let me get on, too, unless he'd seen me interfering with Bess bullying and he didn't like it. I took another elevator to my floor and headed straight to my room. I had an hour until lights out, but thought I might go to bed early. It had been a long day and I was beat. I waved my card in front of the card reader next to my door, then opened the door and frowned. Lori was lying on her bed one hand behind her head. When I walked in and closed the door, she glared at me. What is it with you? I didn't feel like dealing with her, but knew I didn't have a choice. What was I supposed to do instead? Go to the gym where Austin and maybe Hanson were? No way. What's wrong? I asked. Are you trying to get on everyone's bad side? I sat on my bed. I don't know what you're talking about. Although I had an idea. That girl you were talking to, Beth? Yeah? You don't want to get on her bad side. I couldn't help it. I laughed. Lori sat up. What's so funny? Does she have a good side? I asked. Lori rolled her eyes. I guess you'll never find out now. She just seems like a bully. I looked straight at Lori. I hate bullies. Lori narrowed her eyes like she knew I was trying to tell her something but didn't quite get it. What you don't seem to understand, Lori said is that if you make her an enemy, I become her enemy too. Oh, I said. Yeah, idiot. She turned away and fluffed her pillow, then looked at me. You might not care about having people hate you, but I do care. Why? She recoiled like the thought offended her. Look, I know you just got here and everything, but if you don't want your time here to be any worse than it has to be, you'll try to make as many friends as you can. She smiled. Look at me, for example. I have lots of friends here. Those girls who sit at the table with us really like me. I wondered what she would say if I told her that wasn't strictly true, but decided she would have to find that out for herself. Instead, I nodded. Okay. Then I went to my closet and picked up a pair of pajamas. I'm going to bed. I'm super tired. Whatever, she said. I have homework.
I didn't take my glasses off until I was ready to climb into bed. I didn't know how much they helped my disguise, but when I wore them, I felt like they provided a thin layer of protection against being discovered. When I woke up the next morning, I stared at the ceiling for a few minutes, my heart pounding as I thought about getting on the scale and having the retinal scanner record my identity. Would the contacts I wore really work? Or would the machine be too smart and know I was really Morgan Campbell, the wanted criminal? I threw back the covers, Lori was still in bed, grabbed my things, and went down the hall to the bathroom. At least Beth wasn't on this floor, so I knew I wouldn't have to face her. I wasn't sure if Amy was on my floor. When I entered the bathroom, there were two other girls getting ready, so I was able to go right into a shower. After I got dressed, I took a step toward the scale in the corner, then hesitated. I glanced at the girls who were doing their hair in front of the mirror, but they ignored me as they chatted with each other. I took a deep breath and slowly released it, gathering my courage. I tried to push away the image of a dozen enforcers bursting into the bathroom and taking me into custody, and instead stepped on the scale. I lifted the retinal scanner so that it was at eye height and forced myself to stand still as a red light scanned my eyes. Unlike the scale at home, this one didn't announce the name of the person on the scale, so I had no idea if my contact lenses were working correctly. A digital readout of my weight appeared and I stepped off the scale. I lifted my towel from the counter and paused a second, listening for the sound of a dozen pair of men's boots in the hallway but all I heard was a chatter of the two girls in the room. Chapter 34 I left the bathroom and went back to my room where Lori was just getting up, then filled out my food journal and worked a little more on the essay that Mrs. Needham had demanded I write. My shoulders were tense as I continued worrying about the retinal scanner, but after fifteen minutes with nothing happening, I began to convince myself that the contact lenses had worked and I was in the clear. A little while later, Lori and I headed down to the cafeteria. I'd considered going without her, but decided I should at least pretend she was my friend. "'Aren't you just hating your job, Hannah?' she asked, as we waited in line in the cafeteria. "'It's not my favorite, that's for sure.' I paused. "'What do you do for your job?' "'I work in the kitchen,' she said. "'Oh, I used to—' I clamped my mouth shut. I'd almost told her that I used to work in the kitchen, too. What? she asked. I put my food journal in the slot and got my tray. Uh, I think I'd like to work there, too. Can you help me get a job there? She laughed. I doubt it. You have to talk to Kyle about switching. Then it's up to your caseworker. She paused as she took the food handed to her. Who's your caseworker, anyway? I grimaced, and it wasn't forced. Mrs. Reynolds? Oh, that sucks. Do you know her? Unfortunately, yes, she said. Is she your caseworker, too? I slid my tray along the rails and took the bowl of fruit the worker gave me. No, Lori said. She's in charge of the re-education class I go to at night. I laughed. Now that really sucks. You have to see her every night. Despite myself, I felt a small bit of camaraderie with Lori. I knew exactly what it was like to have to see Mrs. Reynolds each night. She laughed with me, and my feelings of hatred diminished ever so slightly. Maybe this could be an opening for her to tell me why she was at Camp Willow Moss. Why do you go to the re-education class? I asked. What do you do there? She glanced at me. It's just a different class I go to. Then she smirked. It's certainly more interesting than the boring nutritional counseling class you and the other fatties have to go to. Any good feelings I'd had toward her vanished. I pretended like her insult didn't bother me. So, you don't talk about nutrition? I asked. What do you talk about? Why do you need to be re-educated? I thought you believed in the pledge. She huffed, seemingly irritated with a mere suggestion that she believed anything other than the words of the pledge. Of course I believe in the pledge. She pursed her lips. I shouldn't even be here if you want to know the truth. Bingo. Then why are you here? She grabbed a drink and turned to face the room full of kids. It was just a big misunderstanding, but my dad is working it out. Then she walked toward our table. That line of questioning over, for now, I followed her to the table. As I walked, 
I looked at the table where Amy had sat the previous day. She was sitting with the same two girls as before, which made me happy. I sat at our table with Lori and the rest of our group. Hi, Hannah, Emily said. I can't believe what you did last night with Beth. I didn't see it, Taylor said, clearly impressed. But Emily told me what happened. That was really brave. Or stupid, Lori said, obviously not liking someone else being admired. Although I didn't like the way Lori said it, I had to admit she was probably right. It was kind of stupid to make myself a target for Beth, but I couldn't let her harass Amy. I just don't like bullies, I said. Yeah, me either, Emily said. Her eyes flicked to Lori before she looked back at me. Lori was focused on her meal and didn't seem to notice. Liking Emily more and more, I looked down and grinned. Halfway through the meal, I opened one of the power bars and broke off a piece, then placed it in my mouth. I did that a few more times, then I broke off two pieces, palming one and putting the other in my mouth. Making sure not to look down, I slipped the extra piece into my pocket. I didn't know how much Jack and Danny needed to do their testing, but hoped if I could smuggle a few pieces in my pocket each day, they would have enough to get what they needed. I would just have to find a good place to hide the pieces. When I saw Amy walk away from her table, I got up. I wanted to talk to her. Done already? Lori asked. Yep, I've got to get to my job. You really wolfed that food down, Lori said as she smiled in a mocking way. I was really hungry, which was true. In the few weeks I'd stayed at Jack's place, I'd eaten more than normal. How else to put on weight? And now I was more famished than ever. It must be hard to have to cut back on your food. Lori made sure to say it loud enough for the others at our table to hear. Her attitude about overweight people seemed exactly the same as when I'd known her outside of Camp Willamas. Truthfully, I was a little surprised. After being here herself and seeing what everyone had to go through, I sort of expected her to have empathy for them. The fact that she didn't made me wonder if the videos I was recording would have any effect on the hearts and minds of the people outside of this fat center. Yeah, I said. It really is. I looked at Emily, and she nodded in agreement. I think it's good for us, Taylor said, ever the brown noser. Me too, Madison chimed in. How else are we going to get healthy? Lori raised her eyebrows and tilted her head to the side as if to say, See? I looked at Brittany, who had seemed uncomfortable the day before when Lori had attacked Emily for saying the cookie rule was dumb. She stared at her plate, evidently not wanting to take sides. I glanced toward Amy, who had just dropped off her tray. Well, I said, I'd better get going. See you at lunch, Emily said with a smile. See you, I said. Then I hurried to throw away my trash and drop off my tray before walking quickly toward Amy. Chapter 35 I caught up with Amy before she got on the elevator. Hi, Amy! I made sure to disguise my voice as best I could. She barely looked at me, instead keeping her eyes forward. Hi, what did you say your name was? Desperately wanting my sister to know it was me, but terrified to reveal my true identity for fear of the enforcers finding out, I hesitated. After a moment, I said, Hannah. Thanks again for last night, she said. Does that happen often? We shuffled forward, waiting our turn to get on the elevator. She looked at me out of the corner of her eye, something I noticed she did a lot. Why? she asked. I didn't have a good answer for her. I knew there was nothing anyone would do about it. I'd experienced best bullying myself, so I let the matter drop. What's your job here? I work in the laundry, she said. We moved to the front of the line, and an elevator door opened. She got on, and I made sure to get on as well, even though several other kids were pushing their way in. What's your job? Amy asked. Cleaning the bathrooms on my floor. I had to do that when I first got here, too, she said. Oh, I paused. I'm on the eighth floor. What about you? Really? I heard the smile in her voice. Me, too. This time, when I looked at her, she looked at me full on. Our eyes met, and after just a second, her brows pulled together. Had she recognized me? Then she bit her lip and looked down. After stopping a few times, we arrived at our floor and got off together. She was very quiet as we walked down the hallway, and I wondered what she was thinking. She stopped next to a door. 
This is my room. She looked at me again, and an expression of hurt crossed her face. I had to know. Is everything okay? She smiled. Yeah, of course. Then she hesitated. It's just that you remind me of someone. Oh, obviously thinking about me pained her. That made me feel terrible. But at least she didn't recognize me. Not yet. I've got to go, she said. See you later. Bye, Amy. She went into her room, and I went to the supply closet slash office and got the cart, then started cleaning the bathrooms. I pushed the cart down the hall and saw Jessica, the other girl who cleaned the bathrooms on our floor, coming toward me. Hey, she said, stopping next to me. Hi. I have extra homework I need to do. Can you cover for me? What? I'd been there less than 24 hours and already she wanted favors for me. Yeah, she said. It's cool. Maybe for you, I wanted to say. She wouldn't be the one doing extra work. What about Kyle? She laughed. He won't care. How do you know? I asked. Have you done this before? She hesitated. Once or twice, but he's cool. As long as the work gets done, he doesn't care who does it. But I'll be the one doing it, I wanted to shout, thinking how tired I'd be by the time the morning shift ended. Thanks! She smiled and walked away, taking my silence for agreement. Anger simmered inside me as I watched her go. For just a second I considered talking to Kyle about her, but it wouldn't be worth the trouble it might cause. Instead, I pushed my cart to the first bathroom and got to work. As I scrubbed, I wondered how long I should wait to ask Kyle for a transfer to the laundry room. If I could work with Amy, maybe I could protect her from bullies and help her to not feel so alone. She seemed depressed. Who in her situation wouldn't be? And I knew I was totally and completely responsible. After the morning shift ended, I went to my room to hide the piece of power bar I'd taken at breakfast. I immediately remembered the clever hiding place Piper had come up with when I'd been here before, on top of a slat inside the box spring. I tucked the piece inside the box spring, then lay on my bed. After spending the last three and a half hours scrubbing the bathroom without any help, I was exhausted. In the last few weeks, I'd gotten out of shape, and all this activity had taken its toll. I thought about the escape plan Jack and Danny had come up with and could hardly wait until the day it took place. They had promised they would get me out of here within two weeks, which would cut it close to my deadline, but would give me enough time to get to the tunnel by November 10th. That was less than two weeks away. As I imagined walking into my house in my home world, an overwhelming joy cascaded over me. Then I pictured Billy by my side as I entered that world, and my joy exploded into exhilaration. But the chances of that seemed somewhere between slim and none, since I had no idea where Billy was. He had been so angry with me for deciding to come back to Camp Willamos, and I was still deeply hurt that he had left without saying goodbye, especially after we'd seemed to get along so well the day before he'd left. I still had a hard time understanding what he'd been thinking. As my thoughts wandered, I drifted off to sleep, but woke to someone shaking me. My eyes were heavy with sleep, and it took a moment to force my eyes open and for my vision to clear. Lori stood over me, her eyebrows forming a V. "'Wake up, you lazy pig!' she yelled in my face. I let her rudeness roll off my back, a difficult feat when I wanted to slap her. Then I pushed myself to a sitting position. "'What's wrong?' "'I told you this would happen!' I'd never seen her so angry, and warning bells rang in the back of my mind. What? What happened? Your new enemy, Beth? I held back the urge to tell her that Beth was actually an old enemy, although not as old an enemy as Lori herself. She works in the kitchen too, Lori said, and she knows you're my roommate. She gave me a message for you. What? Stand up. This can't be good, I thought, but did as she asked. Before I had a chance to react, she punched me in the gut. Hard. I doubled over. The wind knocked out of me. Why'd you do that? I gasped. Her eyes narrowed. It's exactly what she did to me. Then she spun on her heel and left the room. I sank onto the bed. My arms wrapped around my middle and tried to breathe. Beth had never hit me before, so her response surprised me. Was her extreme behavior due to the way her body reacted to the drugs, or did she just hate Amy so much that she wanted to take her hatred out on whoever got in her way? I thought about the drug angle. 
When I'd been here before, I'd seen Piper become super compliant, and I'd wondered if the drug just magnified a person's normal personality traits. So for Beth, and to some extent Lori, it made them meaner. But for other kids, it made them more mild. I knew the government was using us as guinea pigs to see how we would react to the drugs. I could only guess that they would work to fine-tune the drugs to get the desired effect of compliance from everyone. Then I thought about the Amy angle. Why did Beth hate her so much? Was it because she hated me and just needed a target? That seemed the most reasonable explanation, although I didn't know why she would hate me so much. We'd worked out a deal, and I'd mostly kept up my side to get her extra power bars. Maybe she was mad at me because I'd managed to escape. Maybe she wished she could have escaped instead. My breathing normalized, and I rubbed my stomach, trying to work out the ache that had started. I shook my head as I thought about Beth. Did it really matter why she was a bully? No. I just needed to worry about Amy and protecting her. If Lori got stuck in the middle, that was too bad. Collateral damage and all that. It was time to go to lunch. My stomach rumbled at the thought, and I headed to the cafeteria. I just hoped Lori wouldn't banish me from the table. That was all I needed, to be a nomad on my second day. Why did all of my roommates have to be queen bees? Chapter 36 When I arrived in the cafeteria, I got in line and looked over the room. Lori was already sitting at the table with Taylor and Madison, her two most ardent followers. I'd found out they were roommates, and Emily and Brittany were roommates. At least they all seemed well-matched. Brittany and Emily seemed less enthusiastic about the whole fat center concept. Of course, I didn't know if Taylor and Madison really felt the way they claimed, or if they were just sucking up to Lori. And what had Lori meant when she'd said her dad was trying to work everything out? If he had so much pull, how did she end up here in the first place? I gathered my food and started walking toward my table. I didn't see Amy at her table yet. After a few steps, I saw Jessica sitting with a group of kids and stopped next to her. Did you get your homework done? She gave me a look of fake apology. Oh, sorry, Hannah, but no, not quite yet. But thanks so much for covering for me. I truly appreciate it. I'll bet you do, I thought. I wanted to tell her that getting her homework done was not my problem and that she'd better show up to clean after lunch or else. But all of her friends were staring at me, so instead I smiled and silently seethed. The last thing I needed was to make more enemies. I was supposed to fly under the radar, not create a growing list of people who hate Morgan slash Hannah. I walked away without comment, and when I got to my table, Lori glared at me. There she is now, she said, like she'd been talking about me. I added her to the aforementioned list, along with Beth, Hanson, and all the other enforcers, and possibly Amy, maybe even Billy. A feeling of self-pity that no one liked me swept over me as I sat in the chair furthest from Lori and picked up my spork. Taylor and Madison ignored me, probably on orders from Lori, so I began eating and wondered who in this world cared about me or even liked me. I would even settle for someone who didn't recoil at the sight of me. Then I thought of Jessica and was sure she wasn't mad at me, but that was only because I was doing her work for her, and not by choice. Emily and Brittany appeared, smiling and talking. At least Emily seemed to be a candidate for a friend. Emily sat next to me, and Brittany sat on the other side of Emily. Hey, she said to the group. What's going on? Ask Hannah, Lori sneered. All eyes shifted to me. This was getting ridiculous. How did I even know Lori was telling the truth about Beth? Maybe Lori was making it all up to have an excuse to punch me. I knew how she liked to lie to make herself look better. Lori hit me, I stated, then took a bite of my food and sat back to watch the chaos erupt. What? Emily said, her eyes wide with a shock. Why would you do that? Brittany said. That's not exactly true, Taylor said at the same time as Brittany. I held back a grin, my self-pity lifting a bit to watch them act exactly as I had predicted. Then what happened? Emily asked, looking at me. I sat forward. All I know is that I was asleep. Lori woke me up, then she punched me in the stomach. I paused for emphasis. It really hurt, too. I couldn't even breathe. All eyes shifted to Lori. 
What the heck, Lori? Emily said, her true feelings for Lori filtering through like sunlight through partially open blinds. Lori sat up straight in her chair, anger clouding her eyes. She's not telling the whole story. Which is? Emily pressed. I know how much you admired Hannah's bravery. Lori made air quotes on the last word. But sometimes there are consequences. You mean with Beth? Brittany asked. Duh, Taylor said. What happened? Brittany asked, seeming even more interested now. During my morning shift, Lori said, Beth cornered me and told me she wanted me to give Hannah a message. Then she punched me in the stomach. Emily and Brittany gasped. And you hit Hannah? Emily looked confused by this part. Why would you do that? Couldn't you just tell her what Beth did? Lori smirked. I thought the message would be more effective if I delivered it the way it was meant to be delivered. Emily didn't say anything, and I wondered what she was thinking. Then she turned to me. Are you okay, Hannah? What about me? Lori asked. I'm the one Beth punched, and she hits really hard. Are you okay? Emily asked Lori, but she didn't seem to have her heart in the question. I'll live, Lori said. She turned back to me. What about you? I'll live too, I guess, I said. What are you going to do now? Emily asked me. About Beth, I mean. I don't know. And I didn't. Beth had taken things to a whole new level, and I didn't know what else she was capable of. She's going to stay away from her, Lori said. That's what. Otherwise, she, she pointed to me, will have me to deal with. I don't need Beth on my case. Lori was not my priority. She didn't even make it onto the priority list. Amy was my first priority. Getting out of this place was next, and last was getting the information for Jack and Danny, but only because that was the agreement I'd made with them. Lori looked at me. Agreed? I nodded. I had no plans to intentionally provoke Beth, but if she bullied Amy and I was there, I wouldn't stand by and do nothing. We ate the rest of our lunch without the topic of Beth coming up, and I kept a surreptitious eye on Amy after she sat at her table. No one bothered her, and she seemed a little happier today. Maybe having me standing up for her helped to raise her spirits. The thought certainly raised my spirits. Chapter 37 After lunch, when I went to the supply closet slash office to pick up my cart, Kyle was there. Hi there, Hannah. How are things going? I was sorely tempted to tell him about Jessica skipping work, but decided I didn't want to be a snitch. Okay. Good, he paused. Okay, then. Get to work. Well, duh, I wanted to say. Why else was I there? I'd only stopped because he'd asked me a question. I gathered supplies from the shelves, loading up my cart, then headed to the bathroom where I'd left off earlier. I wasn't working quite as fast as I had when I'd been at Campo Lamas the first time. I could only assume it was because I'd gotten more out of shape and it was harder to work for long stretches without getting worn out. By the end of my shift, I hadn't had time to get everything done. One bathroom hadn't been touched at all. But I hoped Kyle wouldn't notice. It wasn't my fault anyway. If Jessica had done her share, we would have been done early. I put the cart back, freshened up, then got my backpack and took the elevator to the classroom floor. I had social studies first. When I arrived, most of the kids were there and I recognized one of them, Piper. She was the one who had originally suggested escaping this place, and she was the one who'd taken the knife that we'd used to cut out the tracking chip, but she'd backed out from escaping just days before Billy and I had gotten out. I remembered how the compliance drug had made her more conscientious about following the rules, and how she'd wanted to turn the knife back in and confess that we'd taken it. When I looked at her now, I wondered if she was still being a stickler about following rules. I decided to sit as far from her as possible. There was no point in taking a chance on her recognizing me. I found a seat across the room from her and a little behind her. I got through social studies without her noticing me, then headed to science. When I walked in, I immediately saw Amy sitting at a table by herself, so I walked over to her. Is anyone sitting here? I said, using my Hannah voice, which I only used around Amy. Oh, hi, Hannah, she smiled. No, you can sit there. I slid into the seat and took out my science book. I've been thinking, she said. Then she stopped, looking a little embarrassed. I turned to her. Yeah? Well, 
As long as I have to be in this place, I can use as many friends as I can get. She laughed. It's not like I have people lining up to be my best friend, but it's only fair to warn you that if certain people see that you're my friend, you might not like what they do to you. I thought about Beth's message and had no doubt that Amy was not exaggerating. Okay? Sadness flitted across her face. You can change your mind if you want. She looked at the desk. I'll understand. My heart broke as I looked at my little sister. What have I done to you, I thought. My throat ached as a knot formed there and warm tears pushed into my eyes. She must have taken my silence to mean I was reconsidering being her friend because her shoulders slumped. It was hard to speak around the lump in my throat and I forced back the tears that had formed. No, Amy, I want to be your friend. I don't care what everyone thinks. She slowly lifted her head and turned toward me, undisguised hope in her eyes. Really? Then uncertainty replaced the hope. This is Lori's idea, right? No, I said with a ferocity that surprised me. I dropped my voice to a whisper. I hate Lori. Amy seemed to believe me, though I could only imagine the care she needed to take at any overture of friendship. I wondered how many times she'd been burned by people pretending to be her friend. She smiled and asked, Will you sit with me at dinner? Her request was unexpected, and I hesitated. What would this mean for me? Would Lori make my life more difficult? Would everyone turn against me? But this was my sister, and the only reason I was there was because of her. Amy frowned at my silence. I'm sorry. Maybe it's too soon to ask that of you. You only got here yesterday. What kind of a loser was I? First, my choices got my sister sent here in my place. Then I try to be friends with her, but when she makes a simple request, I worry about what people will think. Really? Of course I'll sit with you, I said. Are you sure? I nodded. Yes! Her face lit up. Yay! I laughed despite the worry that whispered in the back of my mind. When class finished, Amy suggested we go together to our floor to drop off our backpacks then go to the cafeteria together. When we arrived at the cafeteria and got in line to get our food, I could tell Amy was excited to have me with her. I'd only seen two other girls sit with her, and I was grateful to them for being friends with her, so I was certain she was quite pleased to have another person to add to her group. We collected our meal, then headed to Amy's table. As we walked, my gaze wandered to Lori and the other four girls. They didn't seem to notice me, at least not yet, but I had to admit I was nervous about the way Lori would respond. This is my new friend Hannah, Amy said, as we sat at her table. The other two girls studied me, and I wondered if there had been other new friends who had turned on Amy. Hi, I said, trying to show my sincerity through my smile. Hey, they both said. This is Chloe and Amber, Amy said. Chloe's my roommate. Both girls were about Amy's age, 13, and both were overweight. I wondered where Amber's roommate was, since it seemed most roommates sat together at mealtime. Maybe she wasn't willing to risk being associated with Amy. Hannah and I have two classes together, Amy said, seemingly trying to pull the other two girls into a conversation. That's cool, Chloe said. Then she looked at Amy and ignored me. Hey, Amy, were you able to get that load finished after I left? You must work in the laundry, too, I said. She glanced at me. Yeah. Then she went back to pretending I wasn't there. Clearly, she didn't trust anyone who suddenly showed up wanting to be Amy's friend. While I appreciated her protectiveness, I was Amy's sister, and I couldn't help but feel offended. I put my feelings aside and ate my dinner, and put a chunk of power bar in my pocket. Toward the end of the meal, Chloe looked just past my shoulder and said, "'What does he want?' I looked over my shoulder to see who she was talking about. Hansen was approaching our table. I quickly looked away, but my heart hammered in my chest, and I hoped no one was monitoring my heart rate. Amy looked too, then gasped, and whipped her head around to face forward. Obviously, these girls were familiar with Hansen and his mean streak. I'd seen him abuse Amy in the gym just the evening before, but how often did he harass her in the cafeteria? My back was to him, and I hoped he would ignore me, not that I wanted him to bother Amy, but I was terrified he would recognize me, then it would all be over. A sharp jab bit into my back. Chapter 38 "'Who are you?' Hansen asked, obviously talking to me. 
My eyes widened, and I met the stares of Chloe and Amber, who were sitting across from me. This is Hannah, Amy said. Her voice wavered ever so slightly. I wasn't talking to you, loser. He jabbed me again. Turn around when I'm talking to you. I had enough of my wits about me to turn the camera on before slowly turning in my chair. Even though the video would be better if it showed his face, I kept my gaze glued to the floor. I really, really didn't want to meet his eyes. Why are you sitting with this table full of rejects? Or are you a reject too? He laughed. You're here, so I guess you are a reject. He paused, and I hoped he was done. Who's your roommate? Uh Uh-oh. I stayed silent, really not wanting to answer his question. This time he shoved me in the shoulder. Look at me and answer my question. Anger laced his voice. I lifted my gaze enough to look at his face, and the fury there was clear. I flashed back to the night I'd stabbed him and remembered his promise to me. I will kill you. My heart pounded so hard I thought it would burst. Who, he demanded, no hint of recognition on his face. Lori, I whispered, over there. I motioned in the direction of the table where she sat with her gang of admirers. Hansen glanced toward them, then back at me. You'd better learn to show some respect. He didn't deserve any respect as far as I was concerned, but I kept my thoughts to myself. He walked away, and I was able to breathe normally again. But then I saw him walk straight to Lori and say something to her. He motioned toward me, and she looked at me, her eyes narrowed. Then Hansen shoved her shoulder and walked away. Lori threw daggers with her eyes, and I felt every one of them land in my gut. It was too late to do anything about it, so I turned away from her glare and back toward Amy and her two friends. "'I'm so sorry, Hannah,' Amy said. "'It's not your fault.' I couldn't stop the shaking in my voice. "'And now we'll never see her again,' Chloe muttered. "'So this had happened before?' "'No!' I shook my head. "'I'm not going anywhere.' If Amy could handle the awfulness of this place, surely I could stay by her side. We'll see, Chloe said. I turned off the camera and my glasses and sat there for a minute. I have to do my workout, I said. And there she goes, Chloe said. No, really, I haven't worked out yet today and this is the time I go. Me too, Amy said. Maybe we could go together. Sure, I said, glaring at Chloe, daring her to say something, but she just stared back. Amy and I dropped off our trays, then went to our floor. I'll come get you after I change, I said. Okay, see you. I put the pilfered piece of power bar in the box springs, then changed into my workout clothes. I was nearly done when Lori burst into the room. You can't sit with that girl, she yelled. If you do, it's like I'm sitting there too. I might as well just come sit with you and get it over with. What did Hanson say to you? I asked as I finished tying my shoes. Who? That enforcer. She looked at me funny, like it was odd I would call an enforcer by name, and I realized it was odd. He said it was a bad idea for you to sit there and that I should learn to control my roommate. I bristled at the idea. She would never control me. You can sit with me at Amy's table if you want. Her mouth fell open. You're kidding, right? Are you going to let that enforcer control you? I asked. Well, no, but I don't think it's a good idea to openly defy him, do you? So now you care what I think? I asked. Her eyes narrowed, an unattractive look for her. It was a rhetorical question. I have to go to the gym now, Lori. I took a step toward the door, but she grabbed my arm. Hold on, Hannah. I stopped and looked at her hand. She let go, which gave me a feeling of triumph. We have a problem here, she said. For some reason known only to you, you seem to have this need to help poor little Amy Campbell, "'Well, she doesn't need your help. "'She's doing fine on her own.' "'Really?' I asked. "'That's not what it looks like to me. "'To me, it looks like everyone treats her like a pariah "'because of something her sister did.' "'And why should you care?' Lori asked, "'a look of exasperation coming over her. "'You just got here yesterday. "'Why can't you just follow the rules?' "'I tilted my head to one side. "'So there's a rule that I can't sit with my—' "'My face blanched. "'I'd almost said my sister.' My friend, I said instead. Oh, so now she's your friend? Someone you just barely met? She shook her head. That makes a lot of sense. Are you done? I asked. She sighed. I'm getting really tired of you, Hannah. Like I care, I thought. Go on, 
She waved her hand like I was dismissed. We can talk about this later. I walked past her, then rolled my eyes as I left the room. When I knocked on Amy's door, Chloe answered and let me inside. Their room looked just like the one Lori and I shared, although Amy's side was just as messy as her room at home. I'm almost ready, she said as she put on her shoes. A moment later, we headed toward the elevator. Earlier you said I reminded you of someone, I said, wondering how she would respond. Who do I remind you of? Amy looked at me and frowned, then smiled in a forced way. Just someone I used to know. She paused, seeming to consider her next words. Someone who used to be important to me, but now I hate her with all my heart. The blood drained from my face, and it felt like my heart was breaking in two. She hates my guts. She didn't just say it to Austin because he provoked her. She actually means it. She must have seen my reaction because she quickly said, Don't worry, I still like you. I know you're not her. Oh, little sister, I thought, if you only knew the truth. The elevator arrived and we got on. Stunned by her comment, I just stood there as she waved her card in front of the reader and the car moved downward. Hannah, are you okay? she asked. Feeling more dejected and hopeless than I'd felt in a long time, I nodded. Here I was, putting my future at risk by coming here to get my sister out, and she hated me with all her heart. That was a pretty strong statement. But could I blame her? She probably thought I was off in some paradise, avoiding the enforcers and having a great time, while she was stuck here in this hell called Camp Willow Moss, her freedom gone, treated like dirt, and she hadn't even done anything wrong. It was no wonder she felt as she did. But my mission wasn't to make her like me again. It was to rescue her from this place. First, though, I had to get her to trust me. Then, when Jack and Danny came to get me out, she would go with me, and we would both be free. This has been Dare to Defy Part 3, Parallel World Book 3. Written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2013 by Christine Kersey. Morgan's story continues in Dare to Defy Part 4.